Privacy, it's a human value. And there's so many different parties who could become involved. The companies, the government, individuals. We've seen with the recent revelations of the National Security Agency that people take privacy seriously, and that's no longer a paranoid fear. It's a very realistic concern. We need space mentally to play and experiment without the threat of judgment in order to grow into people who are internally free. Privacy is about the appropriate flow of information. And the way I've understood a violation of privacy is information that flows inappropriately, that violates certain values we may have. And what's happening is that new technology can enable different flows and present us with different problems, ones we've never confronted before. And there are people in my field who might look at a Facebook or a Google and say, you've become like a utility company. The public utilities are highly regulated because how many of us could live without electricity, without running water? And so participating in social media, some might argue, is not an option anymore. For example, you apply for a job and as many employers do, they go and check you out on Facebook. But let's say you don't have a Facebook page, then they may say, why don't you have a Facebook page? That's a bit unusual. So yes, it's true that these companies come in and they offer certain services and they say, these are the terms of the services. But ultimately, some might argue you don't have a choice. I think that there are many businesses who really try to do the right thing, but their backs are up against the wall. And if they don't accept some of the activities of the ad networks that monitor across sites and do the analytics and the profiling, their businesses can be threatened significantly. So we're saying it's great for you to be profitable. And yes, we understand you're providing great service, but that doesn't give you a free pass. Right now, we really are in dire need of meaningful rules to level the playing fields so that the values to which we subscribe as societies, as cultures, as communities can continue to be maintained. NSA and the intelligence community in general uh, is focused on getting intelligence wherever it can by any means possible that it believes on the grounds of sort of a self-certification that they serve the national interest. Uh, originally we saw that uh, focus very narrowly tailored as foreign intelligence uh, gathered overseas. Now increasingly we see that it's happening domestically and to do that they, uh, the NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system and it filters them and it analyzes them and it measures them and it stores them for periods of time simply because that's the easiest, most efficient, and most valuable way to achieve these ends. So while they may uh, be intending to uh, target someone associated with a foreign government or someone that they suspect of terrorism, they're collecting your communications to do so. Uh, any analyst at any time can target anyone, uh, any selector anywhere. Where those uh, communications will be picked up depends on the range of the sensor networks and the authorities that that analyst is uh, empowered with. Not all analysts have the ability to target everything, but I sitting at my desk uh, certainly have the authorities to, to wiretap anyone from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president if I had a personal email. One of the when you are subverting the power of government, that, that's a fundamentally dangerous thing to democracy. And if you do that in secret consistently, you know, as the government does uh, when it wants to benefit from a secret action that it took, uh, it'll kind of give its, its officials a mandate to go, hey, you know, tell the press about this thing and that thing so the public is on our side. But they rarely, if ever, do that when an abuse occurs. That falls to uh, individual citizens, but they're typically maligned. You know, it, it becomes a thing of these people are against the country, they're against the government, but I'm not. I'm, I'm no different from anybody else. Uh, I don't have special skills. 
Uh, I, I'm just another guy who sits there day to day in the office, watches what happening, what's happening, and goes, this is something that's not our place to decide. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. And I'm willing to go on the record to defend the authenticity of them and say, I didn't change these. I didn't modify the story. This is the truth. This is what's happening. You should decide whether we need to be doing this. Have you, they'll get you in time. But at the same time, you have to make a determination about what it is that's important to you. And if living, uh, living unfreely but comfortably is something you're willing to accept, and I think many of us are, it's, it's the human nature. Uh, you can get up every day, you can go to work, you can collect your, your large paycheck for relatively little work uh, against the public interest and, and go to sleep at night after watching uh, your shows. But if you realize that that's the world that you helped create and it's going to get worse with the next generation and the next generation who extend the capabilities of this sort of architecture of oppression, uh, you realize that you might be willing to accept any risk and it doesn't matter what the outcome is so long as the public gets to make their own decisions about how that's applied. Even if you're not doing anything wrong, you're being watched and recorded. And the, the storage capability of these systems increases every year consistently by orders of magnitude uh, to where it's getting to the point you don't have to have done anything wrong. You simply have to eventually fall under suspicion from somebody, even by a wrong call. And then they can use the system to go back in time and scrutinize every decision you've ever made, every friend you've ever discussed something with and attack you on that basis to sort of derive suspicion from an innocent life and paint anyone in the context of a wrong Dictionary.com puts 233 tracking mechanisms on your computer when you look up a word. That increasingly people's online self is more important than their offline self. And 75% of companies now require their HR officials to look at what you are online before offering you a job. Uh, increasingly, judgments are being made against us. And we might know, hey, maybe I shouldn't post that drunken hot tub picture. Right. But people don't realize that even something like a smiling photo might be used against them. One woman was hurt in a workplace accident, had four spinal surgeries, and a judge actually said she couldn't have been that hurt if her MySpace photo showed her smiling. Wow. didn't even ask whether the picture was from before the accident or not. So this is being looked at as the real self and, you know, and, and people are losing custody of their children because well, yeah, they posted a custody picture. People don't realize that their email over Gmail is scanned. So if I over Gmail say to a friend, I'm thinking of getting a divorce, or if I do a Google search for old guitars and then I go to a credit card site, I might be offered a less good credit card because people getting divorces or who are in garage rock bands uh, tend not to pay their bills. Wow. Say you do a search for the side effects of a medication. It may not even be for you. You're doing it for your friend or your grandmother. Then you go on a life insurance site. You might not be able to get life insurance because you have looked for that information or you've looked at certain websites and people think, well, I'll clean up my Facebook page. I'll take down incriminating photos when I right, go looking right. for a job. But some companies actually keep the last seven years worth of public Facebook information and their business model is to sell that information to employers. And I've seen some of the, oh, uh, 
the reports that have come out of one company called Social Intelligence Corporation. So if you had an underage drinking photo six years ago in college, they will mark it as illegal activity and the potential employer will just get a report that said you behaved illegally. Going beyond just the general concern that people have about the way that their data is stored and collected, we wanted to get a sense of what is it specifically that they're concerned about. And what we found was that they are uneasy about the idea that things are happening that they don't fully understand, that their data is being collected without their full knowledge, or that uh, it could eventually get leaked or become public, things that they're sort of worried about in the future. Um, to a lesser extent, they were also concerned that their data could be used uh, to market products back to them or that it could be sold by these companies to other parties. So um, a, a large percentage of these people, 32%, said that they were concerned about all of the above. So uh, there are it's kind of a constellation of different things that people are worried about with their data. About Apple, about Yahoo, about Google, about Twitter, about YouTube and others. And we asked them to rate them basically on a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being that they trust them completely. And what we found was no company received an average score of higher than 5. In fact, the highest one was just 4.6 and that was Apple. Below that you had Google and below that you had Facebook and then Twitter. And my guess is, is that most people were responding not because they think Apple and Google do a better job of handling personal, uh, personal information online than the other tech companies do. But because our respondents either own or want to own an Apple product, and they tend to use the Google search engine more, more frequently. So they're not very happy, our respondents, about how the companies handle online privacy issues. But Google and Apple get a little bit of a pass because our respondents like them for other reasons. We asked people, what do you think is more important to California's economy, technology or entertainment? And people, by and large, are saying now technology is more central to the state's economy. And that we don't know whether that's a switch or when that switch might have come, but it's interesting to think that all the press for the Apples and Googles of the world may at some point have started to create a kind of identity of California with the citizens where they feel that this industry is the premier, the marquee industry, and that Hollywood, which at one point kind of defined California and gave it a lot of its personality, may not be quite so important on the radar of a lot of people. Not only are they watching you, but they're also collecting your personal information that can be later used against you. So what do you say to those folks who, who don't care? Why should they care? Well, they may not care because they just don't know that it might mean the difference between getting a job or not, getting a credit card or not, or keeping custody of your children or not. A sexy photo on MySpace for a woman could actually could lose her custody of her children. And courts are looking into things now like, is a dad a bad dad? Should he lose his kids because he liked the viral video of Burger King shooting Ronald McDonald in the face? So no. everywhere you go on the web now is coming into court cases. And it's turning the legal system upside down. In one case, a criminal case, a juror actually posted the facts of the case on Facebook and asked people to vote up or down yes, about whether put this person that, which I thought in was crazy. jail. Yeah. You know? So I think that, you know, you, increasingly you are what you post. And so you might not think about it now, but there might be later decisions in your life about um, custody cases, about divorce, about criminal activities. Los Angeles, the LAPD, charges kids with gang activity if they're wearing gang colors on their Facebook or MySpace page. Well, I looked up the list of gang colors, mm -hmm. plaid, think any hipster. Yeah, everybody wears plaid. I write, wear plaid even. So. Yeah, all black. You know, and so you can be discriminated against in ways that it's hard to fight against because unlike things like, oh, credit bureaus who might give a credit score of yours to a company when you're looking for a loan or a credit card, the data aggregators who are selling information about you don't have to tell you that that's why you were turned down for a job. They don't have to let you correct it if they have out-of-date information. One poor guy can't get a job because his dad had his, has his same name. The dad who's deceased had a mugshot up 
from when he was younger mm -hmm. for, a, for a simple misdemeanor. But now the person with the same name doesn't even get a job uh, because of this other information that had been about his dad. Employers are asking for your password to your Facebook page in order to look at the private side of what you do. For me, the greatest horror is that we become what was called a nation of sheep, that we are just tame, we alter our conduct. And that is going to be the end result of the disclosures we've had about telephone information being used on a massive scale by NSA. And that's where we are now. The technology presents new problems, but our cultural values about privacy remain important. The leaks by Ed Snowden highlighting the extent of NSA surveillance, I think people suddenly had a much sharper sense of how intrusive that can really be. So the question is whether there's a transparency in the process, whether we can break out of the bubble if we want to. The, the greatest fear that I have regarding um, the outcome uh, for America of these disclosures is that nothing will change. Um, people will see in the media uh, all of these disclosures. They'll know the lengths that the, the government is going to grant themselves powers unilaterally um, to create greater control over American society and global society but they, they won't be willing to take the risks necessarily to stand up and fight to change things, to force their representatives to actually take a stand in their interests. Uh, and the months ahead, the, the years ahead, it's only gonna get worse until eventually there will be a time where uh, policies will change because the only thing that restricts the activities of the surveillance state are policy. Uh, even our agreements with, with other sovereign governments, we consider that to be uh, a stipulation of policy rather than a stipulation of law. And because of that, a new leader will be elected. They'll flip the switch, uh, say that um, because of the crisis because of the dangers that we face in the world, you know, some, some new and unpredicted threat, we need more authority, we need more power, and there will be nothing the people can do at that point to oppose it, uh, and it'll be turnkey tyranny. things need to be determined by the public, not by somebody who is simply hired by the government.